In 1919, when the First World War came to a close and the victorious powers began to deliberate over the terms on which peace was to descend in Europe, in the Versailles Treaty, Germany was singled out as the sole power responsible for the outbreak of the First World War. And accordingly, a war guilt clause was inserted, assigning on Germany the guilt for starting the war. This particular assignment of guilt to Germany was driven by political factors, political and economic factors at the end of the First World War. Nevertheless, this sparked off a major debate that brought German foreign policy for the four decades previous to the First World War under major scrutiny. Although subsequently matters had been discussed to the extent how other powers also had played their role in the outbreak of the First World War. Nevertheless, German foreign policy had remained a major historiographical interest for students both of international relations as well as German domestic policy for this period. In the historiographical trend that follows, there are two major schools that have emerged. On the one hand, are chroniclers primarily of international relations, led by people like A.J.B. Taylor and Klaus Hildebrand, as also students of German domestic history, like Gerhard Ritter, who argue that in the four decades before the First World War, German foreign policy could be divided neatly into two periods. One was the period when Germany's Chancellor Otto von Bismarck was the dominant factor in shaping that foreign policy, the Bismarckian era, which starts from the unification of Germany in 1871 to Bismarck's fall in 1890. And then the remaining 25 years was the era known as the Wilhelmine era after the German Kaiser, Kaiser Wilhelm II, who is supposed to have given a uniform shape and direction to the making of German foreign policy. Ritter, Taylor and Hildebrandt argue that by and large these two uh, periods were marked by a sharp disjuncture in terms of German foreign policy. That in the first half, Germany began as a satiated power and was careful in, stride in devising alliance systems that would keep the balance of power in Europe stable and in favor of Germany. And in the second era, meaning in the Wilhelmine era, the emphasis was more on an expansionist policy in Germany, that Germany was aspiring towards a colonial empire as also an, a Europe-wide empire, and finally moving on in the direction of wealth politique. A different group of historians relying, emphasizing primarily on Germany's domestic policy and how Germany's domestic politics impacted on German foreign policy, led by historians like Hans Ulrich Weller, David Kellio, Emanuel Geis, and Fritz Fischer would argue that there was no sharp disjunction between the Bismarckian and Wilhelmine era. That in the Dis Bismarckian era, economic motives, economic imperatives of Germany's industrial development had given the shape to Germany's foreign policy in a particular manner, which in the post Bismarckian era continued to haunt the story of Germany's economic evolution and that in its, in its turn had its impact on German foreign policy. Bismarck used to say that for a balance of power to be retained, the ideal situation for any power to be in a Europe dominated by five powers was that it would have at least two allies on its side and two powers may be ranged against it. That is to say, one has to be a troika in a Europe dominated by five powers. And at the time of German unification in 1871, this he had more or less attained. When the Franco-Prussian War began in 1870, France was diplomatically isolated. Russia was favorably disposed towards Bismarck and decided to remain neutral in the conflict. Austria-Hungary after its defeat in 1866 at the Battle of Sadoa had been more or less successfully won over by Bismarck. And Britain was not particularly keen on intervening or even making favorable noises 
in favor of her colonial rival France. So in 1871, when the Germans defeated France, France was diplomatically isolated. The principal objective that seemed to drive the first phase of Bismarckian foreign policy was the objective of keeping France isolated. This was a necessity which Bismarck considered uh, with the utmost significance because of the manner in which the German unification took place. Alsace-Lorraine was a region that had been disputed between French and German-speaking kingdoms for over a period of 900 years. There have been disputes as to why at all Alsace-Lorraine needed to be annexed by Bismarck. It has been argued that the, at least the prima facie argument, the official justification for annexation of Alsace-Lorraine has been that although it had people of French origin in it, it was inhabited by German-speaking people and therefore should naturally become a part of Germany. Subsequently, historians have argued that the principal motive for the annexation of Alsace-Lorraine was the fact that this region was rich in mineral wealth, in coal, iron and um, other minerals. A further argument has come from historians like Lothar Gall and Gordon Craig. They argue that the principal argument for the annexation of Alsace-Lorraine was strategic. It is argued that Bismarck initially was not favorably disposed towards this annexation, but he could not resist the pressure of the Prussian military establishment and he went ahead and annexed Alsace-Lorraine. Now once he had done, historians like A.J.P. Taylor argue, he had more or less guaranteed the revanchist agenda of France towards Alsace-Lorraine, that France would not rest till Alsace-Lorraine was recovered, probably through a war. Hence, for the foreseeable future ahead of him, we are told, Bismarck was looking at France which was going to be inimically disposed. As a result, one of the driving objectives, Taylor would argue, of Bismarckian foreign policy was to keep France isolated. In the first phase of the Bismarckian era, the general drift was towards closely tying, establishing diplomatic alignments with Russia on the one hand and Austria-Hungary on the other. This was achieved in the, what was vaguely called the Three Emperors League or the Dreikanzler Verhaltnis. The Dreikanzler Verhaltnis was not any formal treaty obligation on the three powers. This begins basically as a solidarity and assertion of conservative monarchical solidarity against left-wing and democratic forces in Germany, Austria-Hungary and Russia. The, discarded, the first initial foray in this regard was made in course of a military exercise staged in Berlin at which Kaiser, uh, Kaiser invited over the Tsar Alexander II at this point of time and Emperor Franz Joseph and together they uh, made their assertion of solidarity against left-wing and democratic forces. Taylor argues that the principal objective behind all of this was to get Vienna and Russia almost on the same page. For Vienna, the idea of a league with Russia uh, as a member of it was not very appealing. At that point of time, Vienna was divided between two uh, forces within the foreign policy establishment. Since Austria's defeat uh, in the hands of, Germany, of Prussia in 1866, there was a lobby led by Chancellor Boist, which had argued that Vienna should look towards an alliance with Britain and if required also with France in order to keep Berlin and Russia both at bay. But because of British indifference, just as Bismarck had faced, Boist's plan did not go very far. At that point of time, Emperor Franz Joseph, becoming doubtful about the British connection, began to favor the second lobby and replaced Boist with Andrasi as the Chancellor. And Andrasi more or less pushed the deal in favor of Bismarck as a result of which the Dreikanzler Verhaltnis came into being. The Dreikanzler Verhaltnis 
was basically an assertion between the three conservative powers on the, uh, on the face of it, but the real obligations that go went beyond the such cosmetic assertion was a tr an understanding between, Britain, between Germany and Russia that if either of these two powers were to be the victim of an aggression by any third power, then the other power would put in 200,000 soldiers by way of military assistance. The Dry Council of Fair Healthness, Taylor argues, was a bit amorphous. It was amorphous, it was vague, because there was no specifics involved, except to suggest that there was some kind of military understanding between Germany and Russia, which was essentially defensive. And there was a political arrangement between Austria-Hungary and Russia over the Balkans. The idea, as Taylor points out, was that Bismarck simply wanted to make certain that there was no uncertainty in kind of, uh, in, in terms of the Balkan situation that could drag Vienna and Rus Russia uh, into war with each other. The problems of this vagueness of the Dry Kanzler Verhaltnis became clear immediately within five years actually of the conclusion by two particular diplomatic incidents. The first one was known as the war in sight crisis. When the first, uh, when the, when the Franco-Prussian war had come to a close in 1870, at the end of which Alsace-Lorraine was annexed, Bismarck wanted to ensure, ensure that France would not be able to recover quickly enough to challenge the loss of Alsace-Lorraine. So a huge monetary indemnity had been imposed on France. A compensation had to be paid for the war that Germany had, uh, that Prussia had to fight against France. Now, <clears throat> the amount of the compensation was kept deliberately so high that it becomes difficult for France to pay up. However, French economic recovery under the prime ministership of Thiers made certain that France was able to repay or France was able to pay the entire amount by 1873. And shortly thereafter, France began to posture much more aggressively in European international relations. As a result, particularly with the coming of monarchist Decaze, French forays looking for allies across the board began to alarm Bismarck. Bismarck at this point of time was engaged in a struggle for domination over the Catholics of Germany, which was known as the Kulturkampf. And in course of the Kulturkampf, as the French diplomatic activity began to grow a major, um, began to grow in a big way, Bismarck immediately clubbed the two problems together and threatened the Catholics that if they were found to have ultramontane loyalties, meaning loyalties outside Germany, then they would have to pay the par price reserved for those who were accused of treason. In the international arena, willing to isolate France, he began to march on a diplomatic offensive, suggesting that France was staging the Catholic resistance in the southern parts of Germany. And just stepping up the ante, Bismarck, suddenly floated an article in a newspaper posing the question, is a war in sight? Once this war in sight, this is known as the war in sight crisis because of the diplomatic flurry it generated. A large number of the European powers were alarmed at the very mention of war. Vienna at this point of time decided to stay neutral. But Britain and Russia came down harshly upon Bismarck. Bismarck, in fact, was wrapped sharply on the knuckle by the Russian ambassador Gorshakov and the British government. And both of them, Britain, remember, was indifferent. Russia was an ally. Both of them admonished Germany in similar terms for embarking on a policy of brinkmanship. Bismarck immediately scaled the uh, harshness of his rhetoric down. The second crisis that afflicted the Bismarckian uh, system was the crisis of Bosnia-Herzegovina and the Russo-Turkish War 1991-1992.
that followed in 1876. In order to subdue Ottoman uh, persecution of the Balkan national uh, question at a time of major uh, domestic crisis in the Ottoman Empire, Russia had decided to intervene in uh, the Russo-Turkish War of 1876. Conf conforming to the requirements of the Dry Council of Haltness, Russia in fact had discussed with Vienna beforehand that Russia needed to intervene in order to prevent Balkan situation going out of hand. And at that point of time, Andrasi had actually consented, Austria had actually consented. Much more important was the fact that when this development took place as Russia was virtually knocking on the doors of Istanbul, the one power that normally stayed out of European internal conflicts, Britain suddenly took a very harsh stand. Faced with the prospect of Ottoman disintegration, which would have endangered British passage to India through the Ottoman Empire, Britain stood forth and gave a unilateral guarantee, a territorial guarantee to the integrity of the Ottoman Empire. Russia, in fact, went on to sign a treaty with um, Ottoman Turkey, the Treaty of San Stefano, which would allow Russia to pull back after creating a very large state of Bulgaria, which was then to become Russia's satellite uh, in the region. In this particular situation, Bismarck was considerably alarmed at the prospect of Austria-Hungary drifting away from the Dry Council of Haltness and emerging as a bastion of uh, something like a revival of the uh, Crimean coalition. And this, as this naturally would also have brought France out of its diplomatic isolation into the British camp, into the Austro-Hungarian camp, Bismarck considered this prospect with dread. So Bismarck decided to uh, play the honest broker. Bismarck proposed an international conference discussing the outcome of the Balkans crisis and to make certain that France remains diplomatically isolated by pushing unpleasant uh, decisions. Bismarck proposed that the conference should take place in Paris and that the French Premier Waddington should be the principal uh, force behind it. None of the powers accepted this idea. At that stage, Bismarck proposed that Berlin should be the venue of the international settlement and he should be the uh, lead negotiator. He should be the honest broker, as he calls it. Bismarck's proposal was finally accepted now by Russia because for Russia, Bismarck proved to be a more valuable ally than any of the other powers concerned and Russia believed that on account of the Dry Council of Haltness, probably Bismarck would end up supporting Russia in this matter, particularly because Russia had acceded to the treaty terms or the obligations of the Dry Council of Haltness by discussing before venturing into the Balkans in the first place. The result was the Berlin Congress of 1878. The Berlin Congress had managed to cut down the Bulgarian state and this was possible because Britain had posed the threat of a unilateral warfare in case the peace of San Stefano was not annulled by Russia. So the Berlin Congress when it happened, confronted Bismarck with the choice of either supporting Russia over maintenance of the Bulgarian state or supporting Austria, Hungary and Britain over its dismantlement. Bismarck in 1879 decided to go with Austria, Hungary and against Russian interests. And once Bismarck relented on this issue, Russia had no way but to annul the San Stefano and go for what was known as the Berlin Settlement. The impact this had on German foreign policy was that having cut Russia out loose, Bismarck needed to make certain that Austria-Hungary remained within the ambit of German influence. It is argued by historians like A.J.P. Taylor that the motivation for choosing Austria-Hungary over Russia were rather simple. In 1878, if the peace broke down and there was to be a full-fledged Balkan war 
between Austria-Hungary on the one hand and Russia on the other, there was a very good possibility that Austria-Hungary might disintegrate. And Bismarck, for Bismarck, this was an anathema of a prospect. So after the Berlin settlement, Taylor would argue, Bismarck actually took another, an extra step by going in in 1979 to conclude the dual in uh, alliance treaty, which tied Austria-Hungary very firmly into the German uh, arena, uh, in German ambit of influence. What were the terms of the dual alliance? The dual alliance argued, the, sign, the treaty signed between Austria-Hungary and Germany argued that if in future a third power was to go to war against one of the signatories, then or to be more specific, if Russia was to go to war against one of the signatories, then the other signatory would immediately declare war against Russia. If, however, any other power was to declare, or if, such as Germany, France was to declare war against one of the two signatories, then the other signatory would at least remain neutral. A.T.P. Taylor points out that in 1879, there were hardly any reasons for Russia to go to war against Germany. So, the treaty alliance term, the treaty provision pertaining to Russia's going to war with one of the signatories, inviting uh, military support from the other signatory, was a very clear indication that it was to be a unilateral guarantee by Germany through, uh, to Austria-Hungary against any Russian invasion. And why was it unilateral? It was unilateral because the only power that Germany anticipated going to war with, France, if France was to attack either Germany or Austria-Hungary, then the other party was similarly supposed to remain neutral. Now, there were hardly any reasons why France should go to war against Austria-Hungary. So, if Germany was attacked, then Austria-Hungary would remain neutral. Now, having secured the dual alliance, having secured Austria within the German scheme of things of foreign policy, Taylor would argue that Bismarck then went on to restore Russia to the Dry Kanzler Verhaltnis mode. This time around, it was a little more difficult because the, 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 the treaty, it, it, there was a formal treaty signed finally in 1882, but the treaty terms were such that it was ultimately not going to be of any significance. It said that if one of the three signatories, Britain, Austria, um, Germany, Austria, Hungary, and Russia, if one of the three signatories were to go to war against a fourth power, then the other two would at least remain neutral. This, however, would not apply if the fourth power was the Ottoman Empire, unless there was a discussion beforehand about any such intervention. What basically Bismarck was trying to do was to ensure that the only circumstance in which the alliance between Germany, Russia and Austria-Hungary could break down, the Balkan Gale would not be allowed to emerge in any big way. Another thing that Bismarck did was, as A.G.P. Taylor would say, was to invent Italy as a sixth power. Looking at the prospect that Britain would remain aloof, France would remain isolated, but Austria and Hungary, Austria, Hungary and Russia could um, break out into a war with each other, Bismarck just wanted to make certain that Austria would not drift away and he would not have to uh, support Russia in any way. He did not want to take sides in this conflict. So what he ended up doing was align Italy with Austria in a military align, uh, in a military alliance, as a result of which Austria was to have its Italian frontier completely safe. The Triple Alliance of 1882-83 that was signed was meant to guarantee Austria's southern frontier. So the treaty argued that if France was to attack any of the powers, then Italy would come to the assistance of Germany and Germany would come to the assistance of Italy. Austria would remain neutral. However, if any of the three signatories were to be attacked by Russia, then military alignment, military assistance was to be forthcoming. 
And more importantly, in case more than one power was to come, such assistance was to be automatic. On the other hand, if there was to be any single, any war in which the signatories were not among the victims of aggression, then at least neutrality would be guaranteed. So Bismarck was simply trying desperately to create a system of alliances which would prevent any major escalation of conflict from a regional war, from a, from a bilateral war into a larger regional war. In the reinsurance treaty signed in 1887, it was argued, was to be the, uh, a new way, a, a new um, generation of peace as it were. This was basically Bismarck's way of buying peace with Russia. There was to that, there were, it, that no conflict would escalate into a general regional war. The reinsurance treaty, however, had a life of only three years. When it came up for renewal in 1890, Kaiser Wilhelm argued that the Russian connection was actually what was preventing any long-standing relationship with Britain. So Russia had to be dropped as an ally. Bismarck could not persuade Kaiser Wilhelm a second time. He could not persuade Kaiser to renew the treaty. This embittered the relation between the two and ultimately led to a crisis in the domestic front which prompted Bismarck to hand in his resignation. At that time, the Kaiser accepted the resignation and gave Bismarck the reprieve. And the Bismarckian era in German foreign policy came to an end.